Next, on the OHIO Podcast, Ohio State receives a pair of commitments from 2022 recruits. We preview Ohio State's non-conference schedule this year and beyond, and we dive into the great eight of our 64 Sports Movie Challenge. And that all starts right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. To hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? Be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who wins. Best Buckeye Podcast, by fans, for the fans, where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO Podcast. OHIO, and welcome back to the OHIO Podcast. I am your host, Buckeye Boggs, recording live from a beautiful central Ohio, a little soggy Sunday afternoon, and I am joined by my co-host, normally from Marion, but he's uh, uh, currently up in Akron. Say hi to Chris Wilds. How's it going, Chris? Oh, pretty good, Eric. Just waiting for this rain to move through so I can uh, begin the trek back down to Marion and uh, get ready for the new week. And I'll tell you, we had a great week, uh, week last week, commitment-wise. Hopefully, we uh, get a few more booms this next week. Oh, yeah. It was it was coming off the 4th of July. There was all kinds of booms, man. started with JT to Amulau and didn't stop. The very next day, we got a commitment from – a wide receiver who, quite frankly, Chris, I didn't think we had a chance to get, but the story coming out of Columbus is that Kojo Antwi, who committed on Monday, my birthday, by the way, uh, nice 40th birthday uh, celebration there, Chris, getting Kojo. Uh, Kojo Antwi uh, was just blown away uh, from what he saw when he was on campus on his official visit, and Ohio State leaped Georgia. And uh, he decided he wanted to be a Buckeye and be coached by what is becoming the gra- the best wide receiver coach in all of college football and Brian Hartline, Chris. Absolutely. And I mean, you can't argue with the success the guy's had. Just look at his recruiting classes the last few years and look at the production we're getting out of those receivers. Um, you know, I think he's going to have a, a, a great opportunity this year. Um Kojo, or I'm sorry, in 2022, rather, as we graduate a few guys this year, uh, you know, Kojo's got good size at six foot, 190 pounds. Um, you know, he's got a nice athletic build. Could put a little more muscle in that frame, though, because he's got a really good frame to build with. Um, you know, I think he has a lot of versatility. He can play inside uh, in the slot. He can play outside, you know, so he can fit into a variety of personnel packages. Great burst off the line. You know, just gets off the line really well, and that's how he gets his separation. Um, he does have good top end vertical speed, though it's not elite. But you know, his real athletic uh, strength is his athleticism. I think. Um, you know, he can go up and compete for the ball in the air. He can come back to the ball strong and run after the catch scenarios. Um, just really a tremendous route runner as well, especially in that slot, and. I think he has generally good technique. As as I saw in most of his videos, he is a guy that actually catches the ball with his hands again. And we've talked about that a lot in the receivers in the past. He catches that ball the right way. Um, You know, like I said, isn't a blazer, but he has, you know, adequate uh, speed. And what amazed me was the concentration on some of those catches that he made in his, his highlight reel. You know, he was reaching all over the place. Uh, reaching behind himself, going up high. Um, and then he's just fearless going across the middle. So I think he's going to be a great addition to the room in 2022. 
Yeah. Uh, so here's what's interesting. He 247 Sports has him ranked 73rd nationally, 8th best wide receiver in their class, 7th in the state of Georgia. The composite is uh, behind 247. The composite has yeah. him as 115th nationally, 16th best wide receiver in the nation, 13th in the state of Georgia. I think some of these other recruiting um, sites are going to have to catch up to what 247 saw because obviously Brian Hartline saw the same stuff as the 247 recruiting experts did in while they were recruiting Kojo. I'm with you. Here's what I wrote down, Chris, I, I, and I'll be honest here, okay? We have two guys we're going to talk about. Kojo is the first one, and, when, and, and I, I don't want to just be an OSU homer and gush over every person we get, Chris, and you'll see that in a minute. But with Kojo, I'm going to gush. I think this guy is the real deal. He's got a little bit of, of – um, Chris Gamble in him is what I saw. Yes. He uh, and and the thing about it is he's advanced run, route runner like you mentioned, but here's what I love. He's got what I call sticky hands, man. He can yes. flat out catch the football. Um and he, and you you mentioned it. He's not a, he's not a burner, but he can run by you. And he is one of those kids who's just got that extra gear to go get it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um he can be a real problem in the open field for defenses but uh the thing about it is he might not have tremendous top end speed but he reaches that top end speed quickly so he's got a great burst and he can get off the line of scrimmage very nice um and here's the other thing his quarterback in these highlight films is routinely under throwing the football to him yeah (laughs) because he's like so far out ahead gets it yes he knows how to adjust to the ball in mid flight. That is an advanced wide receiver skill. That is something you usually don't learn until you are an upperclassman in college ball. He's got it already as a junior in high school. And it's because he has tremendous body control, Chris. The the kid, when he's in the air, knows how to just control his body, kind of glides and floats a little bit. It's a it's it's kind of a beautiful thing to watch when when a receiver can just go up and just get a football at the peak of its, uh, you know, when it's coming down, out jump the the cornerbacks and just seems to be able to stay in the air longer. He's got that, that tremendous body control. Um, and his catch radius is, uh, is awesome, okay? So this kid, even though in this particular class, Chris, he's not our number one ranked wide receiver, um, So he's not Caleb Burton. He's not even ranked as high in the composite as Caleb Brown. Um, But I think Kojo might be up there with Caleb Burton. He might even be my favorite, Chris, out of these group of four wide receivers, Burton, Brown, uh, Kojo now, and then Kion Graves from Arizona. Yes. I think Kojo is my favorite. I just love his highlight film. Now, the two things we didn't see was the blocking. I never saw one highlight of him blocking. So Mm -hmm. he might need to develop the physical side of his game, but I have complete confidence that he'll do that based on the fact that he's willing to fight for the ball when it's in the air. So I believe this is a complete wide receiver who's going to be able to do it all, which means he's going to get on the field early. I like Kojo a lot, Chris. And let's get it out there. Let's start with uh, what's the first nickname? How about – Kojo bringing the mojo, you know, Kojo mojo. Yeah, that would work. That would work, man. I, I, I love it. This is, he's got a great name. It's just a good name. I think I might've mentioned that at one time back when we were doing our lists of guys, Yeah, I really liked his name. Um, the him and he- hero canoe. I love that one too, which is a defensive lineman that we're, we're yes. currently hot on as well. So that's Kojo. I like it a lot. I think this is, I mean, this is a steal. We were not expecting him. We get him. I love it, Chris. Now, now let me ask Eric. With this addition, has Brian Hartline now solidified himself as, without a doubt, the best recruiter in the nation? Mm, can I say it's a tie? Okay. Larry Johnson. <laughs> yep, I got you. Kind, kind of hard to pass up what he did this year, isn't it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I, I, I love them both. He's the best offensive recruiter. Yeah, yes. no doubt. 
All right, we got another boom, though. Um, so tell me about this offensive lineman from Colorado that we picked up, Chris. Oh, that would be George Fitzpatrick, uh, 6'6", 285, four-star offensive tackle from Cherry Creek High School in Inglewood, Cal- or Inglewood Colorado. Uh, he is the 292nd player ranked overall nationally in the class of 2022, 27th ranked offensive tackle, and second best player from the state of Colorado, According to the 247 composite rankings, uh, big, strong young man, has a good wingspan. He's athletic. He's smart, and he plays with a mean streak. I think he has some definite room where he can improve on technique a little bit. But I'll tell you, I, I like his raw ability coming in. Um, his skill set and his style play remind me a little bit of like maybe a Jamarco Jones if, if he really starts – you know, to hit his stride. I think, he, like I said, he has great upside. He's going to add depth to the offensive line room. But, and I'm telling you what the other thing he's going to do is with the limited number of scholarships, I think he pushes some of those four and five star recruits that are ranked higher into possibly making a move on their commitment a little bit earlier. And that may be one of his biggest contributions he's going to make this year to Ohio State. I didn't think about that, Chris. I like that, and I hope that that is true. Because here's where I'm going to take off my scarlet and gray colored glasses. I don't think George Fitzpatrick is a Buckeye talented level offensive lineman. Um, I I see the feet, and for a guy his size, I see that he's got pretty good feet. What I do like about what I saw on his highlight reel is how much that he kicks out. And on swing passes and reaches the yes. linebackers at the second level quickly. So if we're going to run like a swing pass or a bubble screen, he's really good at that. But outside of that, I just didn't see the technique. I didn't see the, the physicality that yeah. I'm used to seeing in the high school linemen that we typically are recruiting. Um. I didn't see him push the pile in the run game that great. One-on-one blocking, yeah, sure, he's good. But some of these guys we've been getting, Chris, they're pancaking the first guy and then just obliterating the linebacker, you know? And I'm not seeing that in his film. This is a develop. This is a development thing here. Yes. I just don't know that he gets the field. I really don't. I, I lined his film up with all of the recruits we got from last year on the offensive line. And I can't say that I like him better than any of the ones we got last year. So no, I'm not no, I'm no. not high on this. I'm not high on this, Chris. And and so I'm not gonna. I mean, again, I try to be positive in just about every guy we get, but I feel this one was a reach. I really do. Yeah, yeah, and I can see. Like I said, I think he's got raw talent. He's he's definitely not gonna. I definitely just don't don't see him be in the field. You know, out of the gate, probably not before his junior year. Um, and I don't know that he is, you know, like you said, the offensive tackle legacy we've got at Ohio state is tremendous. And I don't know if he fits into that, into that mold yet, but I do think he does have the raw, the raw talent. I do think he has the right kind of size, the right kind of strength. And he, like I say, he's got that big wingspan. He's got the, got the good feet. So I think that he's got the ability to get to that point. And as I said, maybe at the top end, he hits the level of maybe a Jamarco Jones. This guy is not going to be, you know, an Orlando Pace type guy. Ever. No, no. Uh, he's Like you said, he's not going to pancake, you know, nine out of the ten guys he comes up against. Right. So He's, he's going to add depth. Yeah. He's going to give you depth. And if he sticks around and he's committed, maybe by the time he's an upperclassman, he's going to push someone for possible playing time probably won't get it but then if there's an injury you've got someone quality there to to patch a hole but i don't want to patch holes in the offensive line i want to dominate on the offensive line and that's not going to happen with this guy that's what i see so again i see the positives in it chris i'm going to i'm going to be positive and i'm also going to say hey maybe the 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 coaching staff sees something here that we don't but let me put this into perspective for you um he was getting recruited by Oregon, Oklahoma, Michigan, Florida, and Ohio State, right? Um, yes. I don't know that Oregon and Oklahoma 
those were committable offers that they had for him. Apparently we did, and that surprised me a little bit. This is a Michigan-level offensive lineman. That should tell you what I think of him. That's not good. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Now we're not, this is the nineties. Yeah. Okay. But this, this, this is not, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, let's see if he develops, if he can stick it out, he will offer us depth. But if he's, if, if we're only taking three offensive linemen right now and he's one of the three, that's not a good look at all for Ohio state in this class. And this is the number one recruiting class in the nation. Currently, Chris in 2022 ranked number one, uh, in the nation, number one in the Big Ten with an average ranking of .9435. This is the Quinn Ewers, Jaheim Singletary, C.J. Hicks, Caleb Burton class right now. And of course, Gabe Powers as well. And our two offensive linemen are Tigra Shabola, who's been in the class for a long time from Westchester, who I do like, yes. and George Fitzpatrick. We need some. We need some more beef up front, Chris. I know we're sp- we're supposed to get another one, maybe two. I if we only get one more guy, I'm I'm going to say that this is a fail for the offensive lineman class and what is the one number one class in the country. We've got to start getting some some four high four star knocking on the door five star offensive lineman, especially when we have one right in our own backyard in Dayton. Man, let, let let's go grab. Yes, that guy. And, and like I said, I'm really hoping that the, this addition brings that boom sooner sooner rather than later. Yeah, I do too. That's a good point, Chris. And I'm going to take the positive with that and say that you're going to call that. So I'm liking that. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break because when we come back, we are going to get into some our first previews of the 2021 football season, guys. And it's going to start with our non-conference teams that we are going to play this year. We're also going to preview a uh, future non-conference uh, games that Ohio State's going to play. And we're going to put a grade on those for everybody. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So stick around. The OHIO podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360 degree high definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at onlinemastermind.com. And welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. All right, Chris, here's what we are going to do. I've got in front of me the non-conference scheduled games at this point from 2021 through 2033. We're going to break these down a year at a time, and I want you to put a grade on it for me, okay? And, of course, we'll end with 2021 since that's who we're going to preview here in the next few minutes. But let's start with next year's non-conference games. We open next year at home against Notre Dame on September the 3rd, followed by a home game against Arkansas State and a third home game against Toledo. Give me your letter grade for next year's three non-conference games, Notre Dame, Arkansas State, and Toledo. I'm going to go with an A on the Notre Dame game. I love it. Notre Dame has played relevant or relevant ball the last, uh, you know, last few years again. Um, they've made runs at, at uh, the playoffs. So, yeah, I like Notre Dame. I think it's going to be a tremendous game. I love it out of the gate to start the season. Cool. Um, yeah. So uh, just give, give it. Yeah. Give it a grade on the whole on the whole thing. Those three teams there. So you're going to go a, a as a total. OK. Nah, I'm not going to go a as a total. I, I don't like the Arkansas State game. I think it brings down the quality of the schedule, although it does give us, you know, it does give us that. Uh, you never want to call it a cake game, but it gives us that cake game, Eric. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to go with a. I like the Toledo game. I'm going to take a B plus on this. Yeah, game. that feels right. I was going to go with B plus too. See, now with those with those other two games, obviously we usually have one big Power Five opponent that we play a home and home with, right? And Notre and, Dame's special. Yes, it, and if, I loved it. I, I went to the last home and I went to the last home and home series. I was at both games for that. Loved it. So yes, and then 
And then usually with the other two, I like to see an Ohio team in there just because of the yes. money that that Ohio team gets from that. That's a big payday for them. And I think I just think it's cool. Now, and a lot of people say there's a it's a no-win situation for Ohio State. I get it. You know, I, I understand why you would feel that way, but I still think it's cool because we kind of kind of follow the Mac a little bit just because there's so many of our friends and family who go to these schools <clears throat> that like for instance my wife uh, she went to Ohio State and earned her a uh, bachelor's degree from OSU before going on and earning her master's from Akron. So this year when we go to the Akron game it's like who are you going to root for babe? You know like of course she's going to yeah, root for Ohio State my, but <laughs> my wife did the same. She went to Ohio State and then got her master's through Bowling Green. So. so yeah, so there's a lot of that. So I like those. So I'm going B plus two because it is Notre Dame. 2023, we open the season with a Big Ten game. I don't know who that's going to be yet, but then we follow that with three non-conference games that include a home game against San Jose State, a home game against Western Kentucky, which I find interesting, and then we're on the road in South Bend to finish that home and home with Notre Dame. What's your grade on that? Those those sets of, sets of three games there in 2023. I'll tell you, I'm still going to give that a strong B, B plus type rating. The Hilltoppers can, they, they can, they can bring it every now and then. They can be feisty. Uh, you know, you've got the San Jose State is is had a quality program the last few years, but again, the strength of that that non conference schedule there is definitely Notre Dame. Absolutely, and we played San Jose State a couple years ago, I think. Yeah. So yeah, that that one's gonna be a. They're usually not that good. Western Kentucky's interesting for me because I got a lot of family from Kentucky, so uh, I just like that one. But I'm gonna go with a B. I think Arkansas State Toledo brings just a little bit more zing to it than the, San the Jose Toledo State. Toledo is Kentucky. what brings that that portion up to the plus, I think. Yeah. yeah. All right. So so let's go 2024 now. They don't have all three non-conference games for 2024 scheduled yet, but the season opener is at home against Southern Miss, which is usually a pretty strong football team. They got a good program. They're not bad, yeah. Mm -mm. And then two weeks later, we're on the road in Seattle against Washington. Give me your grade on those games there for that season. I would say depending on the – third non-conference that schedule has a minus potential um right now i'm gonna go b pending the the third game though okay yeah i'm kind of with you there i'll go b plus right now i don't think i mean washington on the road southern miss that's pretty good Here's where it gets super interesting chris check out 2025 schedule we open the season at home against texas two weeks later we go off we we then play at home again against washington and then an entire month later we are at home against yukon texas washington and yukon all at home that's got to be an a at least right oh that's that's a, that's an a schedule there you know and you know texas let, let's hope they rebuild because let's face it college football is better when texas is relevant um you know, but and and definitely the Big Twelve is better. So, but yeah, I, I like Texas. I, I like uh, you know, they've got a great fan base down there. So I think, and they and they can travel a little bit. So that might that might have some, be some fun there in Columbus. Um, you know, I, I love the idea of of getting Washington there. The second half of that home and home. Um, yeah, that that's an A schedule right there, Eric. Texas and Washington. In the same year, that and it, UConn has not been terrible. They've no they've produced some quality over the last couple of years. They're hitting well, this. They won the they Big hit, they East. At, yeah, they won the Big East at one time back before that conference defunct itself. So well, they had a great tail back out there. Was it last year, year before? I think year before, I believe. I'm it's not sure. I'm not not yeah, followed so UConn too closely. So uh, usually a better basketball school, I guess. Yes, I absolutely. Um, then 2026. We start with Ball State, uh, so there's your Mac school. We go to Texas, and then we're back home against Boston College. Yeah, I wonder if Jeff Halfley will still be the head coach in 2026 at Boston. 
That would be if, super interesting if he if was. Jeff Halfway is head coach, I give the, the schedule an A minus. Yeah. Just because of that tie in. I don't believe he will be. I think he's going to be moved on to a, either a bigger and bre- better college program or possibly even back to the NFL level at that time. Um, I just think he's that good of a coach. Uh, so if he's not there, if he's not there, I get about a B minus. Uh, I'm going to give that one a B plus to an A minus just because you okay. got Texas on there too still. Now uh, we do still have Texas, yeah. Yeah. Here's where – so this is where the schedule kind of gets a little bit thin now with all the filler games, but check this out. 2027, September 18th, in the shoe, the Crimson Tide of Alabama come knocking. And then at some point that season, it says TBA, so there's no date scheduled yet. We go to Boston College. So we've got Bama and Boston that year in the non-conference in 2027. That's an A-plus. I don't that, care who you put that, in it. Yeah, that, that's an A-plus schedule. I agree. Again, uh, if, if halfway still there, man, I love it even more. Uh, you know, is, is Satan still going to be residing in in Alabama at that time? I don't know. But either way, it's still Alabama. It's still, you know, two of the three best programs in the country over the better portion of the last decade. I just – that's that's a blockbuster schedule right there no matter who you put in third. 2028. At Alabama on September 9th. That's the only one that's scheduled there. Again, I don't care who you else put in there. A plus. Agreed. Agreed. 2029, no game scheduled. I look for the 2020 game at Eugene, Oregon against Oregon to be made up in 2029. There's an open date there. I could see that happening. Um, Let's go on to 2030 on September 14th. We go to Georgia again. I don't care who you put in this. This is an A plus. Yeah, anytime we get a crack at the SEC and can knock one of their powerhouses down early in the schedule, that that's going to do nothing but bring great things. So yeah, I love it. A plus. Obviously, I doubt Nick Saban's coaching Alabama by then, twenty thirty. I can't help but feel that Georgia might be the power of the SEC by then. Yeah. So yeah, look for that. We're, we're looking to say we're talking what uh, nine years out. Saban's what in his mid sixties now. Uh, he's getting closer to seventy, if I'm not he, mistaken. <laughs> yeah. So let me so look yeah, that up. I, real fast. I, I, I don't know that that uh, Satan is still residing in Alabama at that time, but Nick Saban is sixty nine years old as of right now. So we're talking to be seventy eight. He will almost be. He will almost be 80 years old. There's no way. Yeah. There's no way. He might not even be coached when we're when we're we go to Alabama. So, uh, all right. 2031, Georgia comes back to the shoe again. That's the only game scheduled in that season. I think it's an A plus still. Yep. 2032 at Oregon. 2033, Oregon comes to the horseshoe. So potentially we could have games against Oregon in 2029, 2032, 2033, and of course coming up here in 2021. Oregon, are they an A-plus maker or are they more of like an A-minus on the schedule? You know, right now I'm going to give them an A-minus, but I'll tell you what, I love the the feel of having the the home-and-home with the Pac-12 teams, especially you know, the Oregon who's been there and Washington who have really been their power programs the last few years. I really feel that we lose a lot, I think, in the fact that we don't get that Rose Bowl anymore. And myself growing up, you know, the Rose Bowl was Big Ten champ versus Pac-12 champ year in and year out. I think there's something to that. We don't get that Rose Bowl option because, quite honestly, we've been too good to play in the Rose Bowl lately. Yeah. So... I think that gives that feel that, that, you know, some of us older fans might remember from that, uh, the Big Ten or Big, yeah, well, at the time, the Big Ten Pac-10 rivalry. Yep. Agreed. 
<clears throat> All right, that brings us to 2021. That's this year's schedule. We start off, uh, of course, at Minnesota before we get into the non-conference schedule of a home game against Oregon, home against Tulsa, home against Akron. Before I dive into Oregon and I give you their team preview, everybody, Chris, put a letter grade on this year's non-conference schedule of Oregon, Tulsa, and Akron. I'll tell you, this, this had potential to be a pretty solid preseason schedule at one point. I just think we're going to touch on it a little bit here. The, the losses that Tulsa took uh, via the transfer portal and um, to the draft took a lot away from their defense. I think Oregon, you know, quarterback-wise, I think there's some questions, even though they do have a great defensive lineman in the mix. I'm going to give this, and Akron is having a down season. I mean, or is, is coming off a very down season. I'm going to give this right now a, I'm going to give it a B minus right now. Yeah, I'm with you. I was going to say B. I, 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 you know, you might, you know, depending on Tulsa, because I don't know a whole lot about them. Might go B minus. I know when Tulsa came to the shoe a couple years ago, I was there. It was a it was a weird game. Yeah. Um, it was the game where the, like it, like at halftime they had, we had the thunderstorm, lightning storm, and yep. it was delayed a couple hours, and and we didn't play very good until right before halftime when the storm started to happen. And all of a sudden, our defense came alive, and um, <clears throat> uh, Hooker got a, a pick six that game, and it kind of just changed the momentum of the game and we came out of halftime, we dominated Tulsa, but um, it was a weird game, but Tulsa's not bad. They're, they usually are a very good team that recruit very well, but unfortunately they've not been able to keep people. The, the, the transfer portal seems to have hit them hard. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, but yeah, I'm with you. B minus B sounds about right. So let's get into Oregon here <clears throat> and we'll just go down the list. Um, Chris, here's what's interesting about Oregon. There is a lot of buzz, and I've been I've been in doing this research and really getting into this Oregon game. There is a lot of people on the West Coast and Oregon fans who have one of two opinions. Number one, it is this is going to be a good game, but we just don't have the horses to hang with Ohio State. They'll probably pull away in the second half. The other opinion that they have is that Oregon is going to upset Ohio State. That Oregon is poised to to take the Pac-12, go to go back to the conf, uh, college football playoff this year, and it starts with the trip to Columbus. I am not of that opinion. In fact, I don't believe this Oregon team is anywhere as good as the Oregon team that we last played in the college football playoff when we won a national oh, championship no. in 2014. In fact, I'll even go one step further. I don't think this Oregon team this year is as good as the Oregon team we saw two years ago or even the one that finished last year. Oregon might have won the Pac-12 last year, but they really didn't deserve to win the Pac-12. They won it because of COVID. Washington was a better football team than them. But un unfortunately, Washington got the COVID, and so Oregon got to go to the Pac-12 championship, and there they dom dominated USC. Seemed like they figured out some things as a team, and lo and behold, Oregon finishes the year you know, with a winning a bowl game, feeling good about themselves, and they've got a lot of momentum going into this season. But I'm just not seeing it. When you break down their, their roster, you break the, the statistics down – this is a team and a game, Chris, that I think if Ohio State plays their cards right and we've got a quarterback out there that can distribute the the, uh, the the football to all of the talent that we have on the outside and our wide receivers, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and our running back in our running games can, can can control the line of scrimmage, which which will be from an offensive line that should be much better than Oregon's uh, defensive line, in my opinion. We win this game, and I think we win this game easily. So that being said, here is Oregon. Oregon is 60, has 668 wins to 499 losses and 46 ties as a school. That's a winning percentage of 570. Their bowl record, Chris, historically is 15 and 18, and they have won 13 Pac-12 championships, which is well behind USC. 
They are coached by fourth-year head coach Mario Cristobal, who's considered one of the top ten coaches in college football and an up-and-coming coach in in the game. Uh, he has an overall record of 25 and 10 with the Ducks, including back-to-back Pac-12 championships and two and two in bowl games with Oregon. Here's where things get interesting, I think. So players lost to the NFL draft. Of course, offensive tackle Panay Sewell, who did not play last year, he set out, uh, was the first round, seventh overall pick to Detroit. Then there was a second round um, a safety in Javon Holland, who they lost, who went 36 overall to the Dolphins. And then there was a couple late rounders, fifth round cornerback Demondre Lenore, went 172nd overall to San Francisco. Safety Brady Breeze went in the sixth round, 215 overall to the Tennessee Titans. And then their other quarterback, Thomas Graham Jr., went in the sixth round, 228 overall to the Chicago Bears, which means he's now a teammate of Justin Fields. So those were the players that were lost to the NFL. What about players lost to the transfer portal? Well, starting quarterback Tyler Show. Uh, or Shu, however he pronounces his name, Shu or Shu, S H O U G H, he ended up transferring out of Eugene and is now going to be the starting quarterback for the Texas Tech Red Raiders. So interesting that they lose their starting quarterback from last year, and yet they still think they're going to be better. Now, some believe it's because they have a better quarterback waiting in the wings, but that means it's an unproven. Um, quarterback who doesn't have any experience, just like Ohio State's, and quite frankly, Ohio State has recruited the quarterback position much better than Oregon has in recent history. So I think advantage Ohio State there, big time. They also lost their starting weak side linebacker, Isaiah, Isaiah Slade Matu, Matutui? Matutui, I believe is how that's pronounced. Uh, he transferred to SMU, who, by the way, Chris, I don't know if you've been paying attention to recruiting, all of a sudden, SMU is killing it. Yes. Um, with the name, image, likeness thing, does this remind you a little bit of the way SMU was back before they got the death penalty when they were paying players? Yeah. Uh, SMU yeah. might become a powerhouse, folks. Just saying. So there's that. So they've lost two starters through the transfer portal, uh, five starters to the NFL draft. Now, notable incoming freshmen. Here are some guys that you need to be aware of. Because Oregon had the sixth best recruiting class in the nation in 2021 and were first in the Pac-12, led by offensive tackle Kingsley Suamutua uh, from uh, Utah, 6'5", 280 pounds. He was a 95th nationally ranked uh, recruit, sixth offensive tackle in the nation, first in the state of Utah. And he's expected to push and, and push some playing time right away. They also got one of the top quarterbacks in the nation and Ty Thompson from Gilbert, Arizona, 39th nationally, sixth best quarterback in the nation, first in the state of Arizona. And again, he, they believe, will fight for starting right away as a freshman. Wide receiver Troy Franklin from Minto Park, California, was ranked 40th nationally. Uh, good wide receiver, third at his position, second in the state. So this guy was ranked actually higher than Marvin Harrison Jr., not as high as Emeka Buka, obviously, but they think this guy's going to come in and play right away. And they also got Dante Thornton at wide receiver from Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah, that's Big Ten footprint country there, folks. Came out and stole him right out from the Big Ten. 56 nationally, seven at his position of wide receiver, second in the state of Maryland. And they also think he could uh, push for some starting time. And then one more guy I want to mention uh, Bram Walden, an offensive tackle from Scottsdale, Arizona. He was a top 100 national recruit, 10th of his position, second in the state of Arizona. And so he obviously probably will be in the two deep on the offensive line. Those were some incoming freshmen that uh, that were notable. Now, notable via players, uh, notable players via the portal transfer uh, portal. None of them. They didn't get anybody in the portal this past offseason that I think will make an impact right away. Excuse me, gotta take a drink. Battled a little bit of a of a, a summer cold this week, folks. So I got a little bit of a cough in my throat. <coughs> so that being said, the top returning starters for Oregon, the entire offensive line returns, Chris. 
including Junior uh, Alex Forsteth, Junior TJ Bass, Junior Malasa, and this one, just bear with me, Uma V. Lalu, and Senior George Moore. These guys will be key for the new offensive coordinator, Joe Moorhead. He should sound familiar to you all. Joe Moorhead was the offensive coordinator with Penn State back when Penn State was having their best years and they won the Big Ten. Joe Moorhead was that offensive coordinator. And so this will help also for a new Oregon quarterback, which will be a competition between Boston transfer Anthony Brown, who transferred in a year ago and had to sit out last year, redshirt freshman Jay Butterfield, and redshirt freshman Bobby Ashford, as well as true freshman Ty Thompson that I uh, stated earlier. So this is a four-horse race to see who's going to be the starting quarterback this year. They do have a, a experienced running back, however, a senior running back, Travis Dye, he returns. He finished last season with 682 yards from scrimmage and is a true threat of the backfield as well in the passing game. He is joined by fifth-year senior Johnny Johnson III at wide receiver, who has over 1,600 yards receiving for the Ducks, and junior Devin Williams, who began his career at USC uh, before transferring to Oregon and led the team last year in receiving yards. So on defense, you have freshman All-American sophomore linebacker Noah, Noah Sewell, who is awesome, dude. This guy is awesome. 44 tackles, two sacks, one forced fumble last year in a shortened season. Noah Sewell will be the best linebacker on the field in that game. I know a lot of you probably are like, come on, Boggs, but I'm serious. He's he's that good. Junior defensive end Kayvon uh, Thibodeau, uh, also very good. 35 tackles last year, 12 sacks, and he did this in two seasons. And then junior linebacker Mace Funa had 31 tackles last year, four sacks as a freshman. Those are the three guys leading the way defensively. And, yes, Oregon is known as having a much better defense than the last time we played them. And here's the thing. They're going to win this thing, according to the experts, when winning as far as the Pac-12 this upcoming year, based more on their defense than their offense. And, Chris, this was known as an offensive team back under Chip Kelly, you know, running a play every 25 seconds. They were just they were just running you off the field, you know, run more plays than than you could than anybody else does. And you're going to make that defense tired. That was their M.O. a lot. Now they're doing it with defense, which is very interesting. All right, Oregon's schedule consists of a home game against Fresno State before they travel to Ohio State and play us at noon in the horseshoe. Yeah, think let that sink in. They love that. Yeah. Then they go back home against Stony Brook, and then they open Pac-12 with a home game against Arizona, at Stanford, home against Cal, at UCLA, home against Colorado, at Washington, home against Washington State, at Utah, home against Oregon State, which I believe they call the Civil War there in Oregon. So, <clears throat> Chris, that is the preview of Oregon. That is what we can expect from them this season. I think they probably win the Pac-12, at least compete for it. I think they probably lose one or maybe two Pac-12 games. I'll give them one loss. I think they lose against Ohio State. This is a 10 and 2 football team. If they win the Pac-12, maybe they're knocking on the door of possibly getting into the um, college football playoff based off of what happens in the Big 10 and the SEC with multiple teams as well as what happens in the Big 12, but I'm not going to predict that. I'm not too bullish on Oregon like a lot of the experts are. I think this is a very flawed team offensively. I just don't think that they're going to have the firepower to keep up with Ohio State. I think we expose them defensively, even though all the experts say that the Oregon's defense is really, really good. I think our offense is much better. I think we score a lot of points against these guys. In fact, I wouldn't be shocked if we put up high 40s to maybe in the 50s against them, really blow them off the field. I think Oregon at best is 11-2 and if they win the Pac-12. Yeah your, yeah. your thoughts on Oregon, Chris, before you tell us all about Tulsa. Well, I agree with you. Uh, you know, um, the Ducks, they have a one-man wrecking crew in Kayvon Thibodeau, um, who's projected as a high-first round, first, high first round pick in the next draft. And he could wreak havoc if he gets into the Ohio State backfield. However, you know, he hasn't played against a line 
the caliber of what Ohio State boasts, especially with our returning tackles. Uh, you know, offensively, the Ducks are going to have a new quarterback, much like we are, like you said. They don't quite recruit to the, the quarterback position as well as we do. They do have uh, the Boston College transfer, Anthony Brown, as well. But, you know, he's very inaccurate. Um, I just don't see this going as, as well as what everybody hopes for Oregon. Um, I really think Ohio State wins this one 42 to 10. Much, you know, much uh, more offense from Ohio State and a very, very improved defense. If our defense is only going to give up 10 points to Oregon, we have a national championship team. So I hope you're right. I think Oregon might score more than 10 points, but I, I look for us to just double them up, blow them off the field. Very similar to what we saw in the national championship game, minus all the turnovers. If you yeah. remember, I, I score was like, I want to say it was like, what, 45 to 24, something like that? I believe so. I mean, I mean, it wasn't close. And we still yeah. had all those turnovers. Imagine if we didn't have all those turnovers. Right. So, right. And, and if there's one thing that we've learned, I think Ryan Day teaches, you know, not only teaches the quarterback position better than what we ever saw before at Ohio State, but I also think that he's instilled in these quarterbacks to, to play within themselves and manage the game better. I mean, look at, look at how long, when you go back to 2019, Justin Fields went without throwing an interception. Yeah. That same type of mentality is going to be instilled in CJ Stroud or whoever might win the starting position at quarterback. I tend to think it's going to be CJ Stroud. But if, if that's the case, the, oh. I mean, if that's the case, I don't think Oregon stands a chance. Yeah. Yeah. And like we saw, one of the big flaws that Justin Fields has was he held the ball too long. We saw in the spring game that CJ is not afraid to throw away the ball if he needs to. Right, right. That is going to be a huge difference maker. Especially if we are, if we in the running game are getting five, six yards a chunk. I mean, because yeah. then that's forcing Oregon to play the box, and then it's just going to open everything up in that passing game. Well, and as you discussed, they lost to the draft two corners and two safeties. That, that's not a great situation to be in. If Ohio State's passing game is what we think it can be. Olave and Wilson are going to have big days. They're going to have yeah. big days in that game. That 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 one is going to be – and it's the big noon kickoff, the big game on Fox. That's a 9 a.m. for them, typically, the, being from the West Coast. That's going to be tough for them, man. I, it's every every advantage is Ohio State in this game. And I the first game back in the shoe – for fans in two years, I mean, this it's going to be it's going to be absolutely rocking. And depending yeah. on what happens in Minnesota, and there's the other advantage: we play Minnesota on a Thursday. We get a, two additional days to rest up and, and and get our mind right and ready for Oregon. That's almost like a mini buy. Yeah, and Oregon's got to play Saturday and then travel all the way across country and play an early Saturday morning game for them. And and excuse me. Their first games against Fresno State, that's not a cakewalk either. No, not at all. I mean, Fresno, if they're if they're looking past Fresno State, the Bulldogs can jump up and get them. So they've they've got a they've got a serious start to their season here where they've got to really be on their A game. And I just don't see an A game type of team here, despite what the experts are trying to tell me. I think Ohio State wins big. All right, tell me about Tulsa, man. Tulsa is coached by Philip Montgomery, who is beginning his sixth season as the Golden Hurricanes head coach. Uh, he is considered one of the better offensive minds in the game. He's amassed a record of 25 and 37 as a head coach during his time at Tulsa. He is one and one in bowl games, having beaten Central Michigan and then last year losing the Armed, for Armed Forces Bowl to Mississippi State. Players lost in the draft. Tulsa really only lost one player in the draft. But it was a huge loss. Uh, Zayvon Collins went in the first round, number 16, to Arizona. Collins was a consensus All-American, winner of the Bronco Nagurski and Chuck Bednarik Awards. Um, they lost their best defensive player, who in eight games had 53 tackles. Eleven and a half of those were tackles for loss. He had four sacks, a forced fumble, and four interceptions, which he returned for two touchdowns. To compound matters, they had a very, very ugly time with the transfer portal. Um, they lost both their starting quarterbacks. 
Akalib Evans and Allie Green to the transfer, por- transfer portal. Both went on to Missouri to join up with their former defensive backs coach. Additionally, they also lost their uh, third corner in uh, Ryan Nixon. Nixon had two interceptions in their spring game that transferred to San, the uh, earlier aforementioned San Jose State, which is in his home state of California. They also lost tight end Jacob Kaner to Sam Houston, a fourth cornerback in Mike Garrett to Abilene Christian, and safety Lamar Mullins, who is still undecided on where he's going but is active in the portal. Now, they did get a few players back uh, in the portal. Uh, Three-star wide receiver Kenny Mullins, uh, I'm sorry, Kenny Solomon, came over from Tennessee. Uh, Three-star linebacker Will Farinoik, who may sound familiar because he did play at Nebraska. He also joins Tulsa, as does Oklahoma grad transfer John Michael Terry, who is a linebacker as well. Uh, Wide receiver Ezra Taylor, um, transferred in from Kansas. Honestly, I don't know that any of them, with the exception of the linebackers, are going to make any immediate impact, though. Notable incoming freshman, uh, Tulsa signed eight players and has three hard commits that have not yet signed for its 2021 class. None of the players rank higher than 967th in uh, the 247 Sports composite ranking. Uh, the two most notable recruits are three-star quarterback Braylon Braxton from Independence High School in Frisco, Texas. He was ranked 967th nationally, 65th amongst quarterbacks, and 136th in the state of Texas. Uh, and running back, three-star running back Bill Jackson from Cardinal Ritter Prep in St. Louis. Uh, he ranked 993rd nationally, 71 or 71st among running backs, and 18th in the the state of Missouri. Um, other other players who are committed already: uh, Scotty Alexander. He's a three-star wide receiver out of uh, out of uh, Colerville, Tennessee. There we go. Marquis Shoulders, who is out of Katy, Texas. He is a three-star running back. Jaden Moore, a linebacker, uh, who is a three-star backer out of Green Oaks uh, High School in Shreveport, Louisiana. And Roderick Hopes, who is out of Jefferson, Texas, three-star safety, um, Honestly, none of those players look to probably see the field this year, but they are a part of that recruiting class. Um, Now, notable returning starters. They actually have some pretty good guys who are returning starters. A couple of them missed the 2020 season due to injury, one of those being Shamari Brooks. Rushed for 1,046 yards on 227 carries as a junior. Averaged 4.7 and six rushing touchdowns that year. He was out the entire 2021 or 2020 season due to injury. Tulsa, like Oregon, returns its entire starting line. Now, hopefully, that should lend to some continuity in protecting redshirt uh, junior Davis Brin, who looks to take over the quarterbacking duties full time. However, given what he's they're going to be facing in Ohio State, doesn't bode well. Uh, Defense returns 8 of 11 starters, however, the three that are gone, as I said, huge in the two starting corners, as well as um, the middle linebacker they lost to the draft. Uh, Returning, they do have defensive line anchor Jackson Player. Uh, Player accounted for 37 tackles last year, including 23 solo, three sacks, and a fumble recovery. Uh, They do have Justin Wright, who really stepped up as a linebacker last year. Um, He's really going to have to take it even to the next level with Zayvon Collins gone. Last year, um, Wright co-led the team in tackles with 63 tackles, 37 solo. He also had two sacks, a fumble recovery, and an interception. And perhaps the guy who's got the most pressure is going to be starting safety, Kendarian Ray. Ray had a solid season in 2020, uh, counting for, uh, again, half the team lead in tackles. 
at 63, 44 were solo. Um, he had seven passes defended. But I'll tell you, with the mass exodus from Tulsa as it pertains to their defensive backfield, Ray's going to be huge. He's going to be looked on there not only for his playing ability, but to provide experience to uh, you know a very inexperienced defensive backfield. Tulsa's schedule uh, begins Thursday the 2nd, as does ours. They fa- face uh, UC Davis, and that is at Tulsa. They then go on the road to face Oklahoma State at Boone Pickens Stadium. On the 18th, they come in and visit our Ohio State Buckeyes. They then face off against Arkansas State. They follow that with the Houston Cougars. Memphis Tigers and South Florida Bulls. They see Navy on October 29th, and a big one to watch for them is a rematch of the conference championship game. On November 6th, they get a crack at Luke Fickle and the Cincinnati Bearcats. The Tulane Green Wave come in on November 13th. The Temple Owls on the 20th. SMU, who we talked about a little bit, comes in on the 27th for their final game of the regular season. Um, overall, Tulsa has a strength of schedule, which ranked at 40, primarily due to games against Ohio State, Oklahoma State, and uh, conference champ Cincinnati. You know, I really feel, Eric, that this one's going to be an ugly game. I think any chance against the Buckeyes went out the window when Collins declared early for the draft, and then, of course, the mass exodus from the, the defensive backfield. You know, you talked about Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave having a big game versus Oregon, they're going to have huge, huge explosions, I think, in this game versus Tulsa. Um, I think an improved Ohio State defense, again, is going to show up, and they're just going to beat up on an experienced but outmatched Tulsa offensive line. I think the Buckeyes roll in this one. I think it's I, I think it's 49-7, to seven, and I think most of our guys are on the bench by the time halftime rolls around. U G L Y. Yeah. Ugly. They're going to throw the football all over Tulsa. There's only one game that might get uglier than this. And you're about to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, this is good. That was going to be ugly, but you mentioned it. Akron. Holy cow. I did not realize how bad things were for Akron. Well, Let's start with the positive. So they are 520 wins, 548 losses, and 37 ties for a winning percentage of 487, which is under 500. They also have a bowl record of one and two, but they do have one MAC championship. I think it was all the way back in 2005. Charlie Fry. There you go. Uh, head coach Tom Arthas will be in his third season where he's amassed an amazing record of one win and 17 losses. He was one in five last year. Their one win was against Bowling Green. So I guess there is one back school that's worse than Akron. No players drafted in the NFL. Players lost to the transfer portal included leading receiver Nate Stewart, uh, who doesn't have a destination as of yet, Chris. He's still out there. <laughs> but he knows the he's not going to be an Akron. <laughs> he just doesn't want to play for Akron, man. Uh, I'm not even going to mention who they recruited because it doesn't even matter, Chris, because none of them were even significantly enough really to be ranked. They did, however, use the transfer portal to reload a little bit. DJ Irons, one of the top junior uh, college quarterback transfers from uh, Central Iowa or Iowa Central Community College, that is. Um, he's going to be coming in, and it will probably be the starting quarterback, I would say, for Akron. Uh, Jez Lord Boating, a junior linebacker from Michigan State. He has actually played his high school ball in Dublin. He's a Dublin Kaufman grad. Went to Michigan State, didn't find a, a solid footing there, decides to go to Akron. Yeah, he, He's going to play in Akron. Anthony Williams Jr., he's a freshman linebacker from a- a Michigan State as well. So he he went and played one year at Michigan State, didn't like it. He joined Jez Lord Boating, and they, they both went to uh, Akron. And then a tight end from Kentucky, sophomore tight end, Nicholas Oganovic, is going to be in Akron as well. He probably will find uh, playing time as well. Top returning starters for the Zips include running back Tian Dollard, He had 666 yards of 5.9 yards per carry last year and six touchdowns. The entire offensive line returns again. 
we have got three teams in the non-conference that are basically getting their entire offensive lines back. So that, I guess, is the positive for Akron. That includes redshirt freshman left tackle. Of course, he's redshirt because last year was a free year. Xavier Gray, freshman left guard Ryan Backman, senior center Bryce Peterson, freshman right guard Jordan Daniels, and freshman right tackle Owen Murphy. I said four freshmen. They started four true freshmen on the offensive line last year, Chris, and all of them are back to play again. So I see what head coach um, of Akron is doing here. He's he's giving guys who he recruits the opportunity to play and build experience. And if if the administration and the athletic department in Akron are smart, they will let him do this because by the time these guys are seniors, they will have played so much college football that they've got to be better, right? I mean, well, yeah, they, and they're going to be competing for a MAC title conceivably come that third and fourth year, I think. Right. It'd have to be. If not, then then we've got a problem. Right. The QB battle between senior Cato Nelson, who was injured last uh, last all of last season, but was the starter in 2019, and junior college transfer DJ Irons, and last year's starter Zach Gibson. So they have three quarterbacks who all have experience. That'll be the strength of their team, the offensive line and the quarterback play. Uh, however, the wide receivers aren't that great, Chris. The, the re- leading receiver, returning receiver, is junior George Quails Jr., um, who had 12 catches for 160 yards and a touchdown. That is your leading receiver from last year. That's got to improve for the Zips. Uh, on defense, you got linebacker Bubba Arslanian. Uh, junior, uh, he is very good. He is the one guy who made, I think he was third team or second team all back last season. He's the only one that got any accolades from that team. He's returning. He's a leader, leading tackle. And listen to these stats last year and in just the six games that Akron played. 72 tackles, three sacks, and one forced fumble. Dude was yeah. everywhere. He, he was the defense. I don't know if the other 10 guys were playing, but he was. Sophomore let me quarter- ask Eric, how, yeah. how many, how much time did he spend on the field with that a offense lot. having five, five freshman linemen? You know, a lot. I don't <laughs> think that offense moved the football at all last year. <laughs> so, yeah, he 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 got he got a lot of playing time. Cornerback AJ Watts his returns as well. He's a sophomore. He had 29 tackles, two interceptions, and a forced fumble. Those are really the only two guys on this defense worth mentioning, Chris. This is going to be a young, inexperienced defense with two guys who have who are decent guys. I think Bubba might be a Big Ten caliber linebacker, possibly at a at, a, at like a Illinois or a Rutgers. Um, shoot, I Michigan could probably use him. Be honest with you. Don't give Shiano any help. He's starting to scare me already. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but but other than that, this this is one of the worst teams in college football, Chris. We might actually hang a hundred on them. That could happen. I mean, this is this is a bad bad football team. Here's their schedule this year. They start at Auburn. L. Then oh. they play a home game against Temple. L. Then they play a team named Bryant I've never even heard of, so that should be a win, hopefully. At Ohio State, a big L. Versus Ohio, L. At Bowling Green, that's a winnable game. At Miami, probably an L. Versus Buffalo, definitely an L. Versus Ball State, I have no idea how good Ball State is, so we'll say maybe a win. At Western Michigan, probably an L. Versus Kent State, one of their rivals, I say that's probably an L. At Toledo, an L. Maybe two wins on their schedule. I'll go two and ten for them. Bad football team, Chris. Very, very bad football team. Yeah, yeah, they're not good. It's not going to be pretty. You know, the, the only thing that that we can hope for is that, that Ryan Day shows them mercy and saves his hundred hundred to hang on Jimmy Harbaugh. They you know? will. <laughs> they will score. I would say the spread for this game. They'll will be score at least seven points. It'll be, it'll be, I think Holly, I think Hollywood, I think Vegas will put like a 63 point spread on it. And by the end of the week, you're right. Depending on how things go, the first three games, like if we beat Tulsa by 50 points, this spread might be 70. It might be. So and I'll call it now. They'll cover. <laughs> they'll cover. <laughs> it's a possibility. <clears throat> All right, gang. So there's your previews for Tulsa, Akron, and of course, Oregon. Next week starts the big 
10 previews. We are going to get into all teams in the Big Ten. And we start next week. Believe it or not, Chris, we are going to start next week with two days. We call them our two days, Big Ten two days. We're going to start with Purdue and Northwestern. So Purdue and Northwestern from the Big Ten West will be who our previews will be. And let me tell you something. I'm really looking forward to previewing that Purdue team because we owe them one, man. We owe them one. And we get them at home. So I'm looking forward to that one. All right, guys. Another commercial break. When we come back, it's time to for the great eight of our 64 sports movie challenge. So hang tight, everybody. Thanks for listening to the OHIO podcast. Would you please help us and subscribe, review, and share our podcast from your favorite podcasting platform? This greatly helps us grow our show and reach more Buckeye fans like you. Also, please visit our website at theohiopodcast.com and follow us on the following social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also email the show at theohiopodcast at gmail.com. Once again, thanks for listening and go Bucks! Whenever you're ready, buddy. All right. And we are back. So today, Eric, we begin the Elite Eight round of the 64 Movie Madness Tournament. That's right. The NCAA is going to sue us for this one. In the first round, Eric and myself discussed the movies and gave our insights. In the second round, we gave you our favorite scenes. In the last couple weeks, you've heard us talk in the Sweet 16 rounds about the flick chart global ratings for each movie, as well as the number of people who had it ranked number one. In the Elite Eight, we're going to have a little bit of a review of the box office success of each movie. And maybe discuss a little bit why the film has uh, had the, the staying power it has over time. And I'm hearing that Eric's got a little bit of fun trivia for us possibly included in there as well. So by the end of today's show, Eric, we are going to have our final four. I'm ready. As always, yeah. As always, Eric and I account for one third of the vote each. And you, our fans, comprise the other one third. So here we go. Eric, where are we starting at today? Let's let's start with football. Let's just go right right from the beginning, the one that I'm probably going to be upset about. You know, Eric, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. So in the football bracket, we have number two, remember the Titans. We have number nine, Varsity Blues. Number two, remember the Titans, came out in 2000 and had a box office total of $136.8 million on a budget of $30 million. Its its opponent, number nine, Varsity Blues, came out just one year earlier in 1999, had a total box office of $54.3 million against a budget of $16 million. Eric, what are your thoughts? All right, so let me give you a little trivia behind these films, and then I'm going to tell you which one I'm going to vote for. So let's start with Remember the Titans. So here's the trivia. There is one scene in the film where a brick is thrown through Coach Boone's window. And basically, of course, this is a true story. But in real life, Chris, did you know that it was not a brick that was thrown through Coach Boone's window? Would you like to take a stab at what was really thrown through his window? Oh, a football? It was a toilet. Oh. So the filmmakers changed it to a brick because they thought, just like you did there, it was too humorous. And given the serious situation, they couldn't have a toilet be thrown through the front window of Coach Boone's house. So they changed it to a brick. (laughs) Funny story. Real true story there. Not yeah. funny, but it, it's kind of humorous. Now, let's go over to Varsity Blues. Of course, you know that Paul Walker, who played Lance Harbor, was obviously uh, one of the, the, the studs in this film, the, the Hollywood hunk, if you will. Did you know that Paul Walker actually broke his leg in real life 
during filming of Varsity Blues. I did not know that. So while he's on the sidelines in crutches, he's acting really on crutches. He really is on crutches. For <laughs> real. He really broke his leg. So yeah, so a little trivia there for Varsity Blues. All right. Here we go. I'm still upset from a week ago, Chris. I ain't gonna lie. I think Remember the Titans is a great film. I just love Rudy to death. And all week long, I've been stewing on this a little bit. And I've wanted Varsity Blues to stick it to Remember the Titans. Not because I don't like Remember the Titans. I do like Varsity Blues a lot. I think Varsity Blues is a fun film. It's a great film. I love Varsity Blues. But I love Rudy so much that I I, 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 I want to sit here today and stick it to Remember the Titans and vote for Varsity Blues. But I won't. I, I will be a man here, and I will do the right thing and vote for what is no doubt probably the better film when you sit these two films side by side. And I'll go ahead and go with Remember the Titans and swallow my pride here, Chris. Okay, Eric. For me, you know, I love Remember the Titans. I, I do. I love Varsity Blues as well. For me, it's a question of it was a film of relevance versus a film of youthful nostalgia in a sense um yeah but like you said ver, uh, remember the titans as fun as varsity blues is and as much as we all you know i think especially in our age group could connect with the characters in varsity blues because we played in that era when you could have a just a jerk coach who could run around and grab you out of the face mask and right. drag you all over the place you know, but remember the Titans just so powerful. We've discussed it so much. I'm not going to beat a dead horse with it. Remember the Titans is the better film. The The fans agreed with that. The fans went 38, 13 as well. It's a clean sweep. Remember the Titans is going to represent the football bracket in the final four. Yep. And here's how it breaks down, Chris. So, the football movie will go up against the miscellaneous sports movie in the final four basketball against baseball oh. in the final four. So well, why don't we jump to miscellaneous fo- uh, sports bracket next to see who remember the Titans will face in the final four then. Oh man, I'll tell you, it, it's, it's going to have its hands full in this final round because in the miscellaneous sports bracket, we had the number one seed Rocky, excuse me, Versus the number six seed, Happy Gilmore. So Rocky came out in 1976. Eric, it had a budget of $1.1 million. It grossed $225 million on that $1.1 million. Is it any wonder Sylvester Stallone could do a 20-part series he's working on? <laughs> And then number six, Happy Gilmore, released in 1996, grossed $41.2 million at the box office against a budget of $12 million. Still, not a bad return on investment. So, your thoughts on the movies, Eric? Trivia. Trivia for Happy Gilmore. You'll love this. When Ding- Dennis Dugan told Bob Barker that a stunt double would be used in the fight scenes, Barker insisted on doing his own stunts, saying... Wait a minute, Dennis. I know how to fight. (laughs) That's Bob Barker, dude, doing his own stunts. Love it. Love it. Now, this one's going to take a little while to get through. I'm going to – I I just feel the need to read this whole thing here. Uh, So in Rocky, after producers Erwin Winkler and Robert uh, Shatarf became interested in the script – they offered Sylvester Stallone an unprecedented $350,000 for the rights. At the time, Stallone had $106 in his bank and bank account and no automobile, and he was actually trying to sell his dog at the time because he couldn't afford to feed his pup. But he refused to sell unless they agreed to allow him to star in the film. They agreed on the condition that Stallone continued to work as a writer for free and that he worked as an actor for scale. 
After Winkler and Shatarf purchased the film, they took it to United Artists, who envisioned a budget of $2 million with an established star as Rocky, which would be either Robert Redford, Ryan O'Neill, Burt Reynolds, or James Caan. When Winkler and Shatarf told United Artists that they could only get the screenplay if Stallone starred, United Artists cut the budget to $1 million and had Shatarf and Winkler sign agreements that they would be personally liable if the film went over budget. As you mentioned, Chris, the co- final cost was $1.1 million. So Winkler and Shatarf mortgaged their houses for the last $100,000 for the film. And, had, and that's the rest of the story on that. And and I had heard part of that before, but I didn't know all of it. Yeah, that's amazing. That's really amazing to think about. And he, like you said, Stallone could do no wrong now. But at the time, he he had 106 bucks and, and no car and just his dog. That's all he had left. And this script. And he banked on himself, and it worked. Yeah, yeah, just tremendous. <clears throat> so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I love Happy Gilmore, but this there's no way, no way it beats Rocky, Chris. I've got to go Rocky. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Eric. Rocky, as I've said before, not just one of my favorite sports movies of all times, one of my favorite movies of all times, definitely gets my vote. Um, the fan vote, 27-11 in favor of Rocky. So we've got another clean sweep there. And we have Rocky going up against Remember the Titans. Mm. In our semifinal round. A true Titan versus a film that's remembering one. That should be interesting. All right. Basketball yeah. and baseball. It's up to you, man. Well, let's, let's roll over to basketball. And I'll tell you, Eric, basketball was interesting this week. Very. Uh, so, yeah, we had um, number one Hoosiers versus number six Coach Carter. Number one Hoosiers. Made in 1986, had a total box office of 28.6 million on a budget of 6 million. Coach Carter had a, a much larger box office take at 76.7 million, however, on a much, much larger budget of 30 million. Kind of a fun story. Both these films are at least loosely based on true stories. Mm-hmm. Eric? What have you got on these films? All right. Hoosiers first, Chris. So for the scene where Dennis Hopper stumbles onto the court drunk during the sectional game, Hopper wanted a 10 second notice before the director called action. He spun around for 10 seconds, allowing him to stagger onto the court and appear drunk. He remembered James Dean in the movie Giant in 1956, asking George Stevens for 30 seconds so he could spin around to better feel the inaberration. So basically, he's spinning in circles for 10 seconds so that when he's walking onto the court, he literally is stumbling because he's 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 dizzy. So that's how we get that drunken look from him from Dennis Hopper in the film. So interesting how can trivia. You not on love that this one. guy. Yeah. Very good. And then here's a good one for you from Coach Carter. So when Ken Carter was asked who should play him in the movie, he wrote down one name. You want to guess who what name he wrote down? Samuel L. Jackson. Bingo. He said, that's the only guy who could play me. (laughs) Love it. So Coach Carter has made a tremendous run all the way to the great eight. And Chris, I have not seen the final numbers, but I was remember. Text. I remember sending you a message early in Monday the week morning, that was like, yeah. I was I like, something this. big is happening on on here with on on these on these uh, votes here. I am going to go with Hoosiers, but I cannot wait to see which way the fan vote went. I because last I saw, Coach Carter was upsetting Hoosiers. What do you got, buddy? Well, I'll tell you, it was close. I, I am going to tell you right now, I'm going to put the suspense to an end because I, too, am choosing Hoosiers. Um, love the film. Uh, I think that, honestly, when I, I saw them matched up against each other, I went ahead and I watched both films again. And really, the, the, just the comparison, I thought that Hackman and, and Jackson were both great. 
I thought the stories were both great. I thought that they had, you know, fairly equal um, standing as far as the 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 cinematography, as far as the the portrayal of the era, and to as far as that goes, even the score. I think for me, it was the strength of the supporting cast, and as you mentioned specifically, Dennis Hopper. I'm going with with Hoosiers as well. Uh, however, the fan vote was 20 to 17 in favor Ooh, of Hoosiers. That's close. So Hoosiers gets a clean sweep, and it's our third clean, uh, clean sweep going into the Final Four. But it was close. That's the first time Hoosiers has got some real competition. Yeah, it, it was challenged, and th- there was no shame in the game of Coach Carter in this tournament. Let me tell you. Right. They they, they performed well. Yeah, they that 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 film to get all the way to grade eight and push Hoosiers like it did that. There you go. That, that, that surprised me a little bit there. So that leaves us to yeah. baseball to finish up, man. And I'll tell you, this one actually had me and my wife at odds the other night. Ooh. Last night we were sitting discussing this in our, our, our little Airbnb that we were in up here in Cuyahoga Falls. And I'll tell you, we came down on different sides of this one. Okay. So we have number three, Bull Durham, which grossed $58 million on a budget of $7.5 million. The Sandlot, number four, which grossed $34.3 million. Surprising to me a little bit, honestly, Eric. I kind of felt like the, the, the box office was going to be a little bit higher there. And that was on a budget of $7 million. So tell me what you got for us so far or, or on this movie, at Max. So, <clears throat> Bull Durham, trivia. As the credits are rolling at the end of the film, there is a picture which is made to be a shrine of the Yankee great Thurman Munson who died yes. in a plane crash. I did not mm-hmm. know that. So definitely want to watch that again to, to look for that. And then, of course, The Sandlot, which I love, by the way. The older and younger Benny. Okay, so you got – you know, the, one of the main actors, Benny the Jet, right? When he was yep. younger, and then the one older, when Benny's older and he's playing for Los Angeles. Yep. Are played by real life brothers Pablo Vitar and Mike Vitar. Hmm. Did you not know that? Surprising. I didn't know that, but it is not overly surprising. I didn't know that. I was like, oh, that's cool, man. I didn't, that's, that's awesome. So there you have it. A little trivia on that. Okay. I love both these films. And when you look at the baseball bracket, I'm just going to say it right now. I know everybody thinks the football bracket was probably the toughest bracket. No. It's yeah, baseball. Close. Too. Yeah. Baseball had amazing films. And I, the Sandlot has beat Rookie of the Year, Field of Dreams, The Natural. Bull Durham has gotten to this point by beating Mr. Baseball – the Rookie, and Moneyball. The Sandlot is a favorite of mine. Bull Durham has got, no doubt, the best lines in a baseball film outside of If You Build It, He Will Come, Field of Dreams, right? Uh, no Crying in Baseball, a League of Their Own. Gosh, I, now that I think about it, they just go on and on and on, right? I still feel, at the end of the day, the Sandlot's got a little bit more something than what Bull Durham has, and that something is the fact that when you watch Sandlot 2, which I did this week for the first time in my life. You'll never I, do it again, will you? I hated it, and I realized it makes the Sandlot better. Usually a, a terrible sequel will make the original worse. Not in this case. The sequel was so bad it made the original even better. And here's how the Sandlot does it. The cast of kids in the Sandlot are perfect. Whoever yes. casted those kids hit a home run. It's lit- They literally went to the plate nine straight times and hit nine straight home runs with that cast of kids. No kid film that I know of and that includes some some great coming of age movies has as good a cast of kids that fit perfectly together in a film as The Sandlot does. I've got to go Sandlot here. 
All right, I'm going to disagree with you slightly because as far as the youthful coming of age films, I think Sandlot gets a run in its casting by with, with Stand By Me, but not a sports movie, so not relevant here. You you know that your that, that film crossed my mind, but I still think the Sandlot's stronger. Uh, and maybe, I'll, maybe, I'll tell you who my second is. I'll tell you who my second one is, even more than Stand By Me is Goonies. Yeah. The yeah, Sandlot is essentially Goonies on a baseball field, is how it feels to me. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. So, Eric, let me tell you. For me, I, I think you described Bull Durham best a few weeks ago when you re- said that movie represented a love affair with minor league baseball. Yes. Everything about the movie is right. Great story, great performances, a superb script. And the mound visit, I think, is one of the most iconic scenes in a baseball movie. Um, by contrast, the stand lot, I think represents a love affair with our childhoods. You know, uh, it represents everything that is good and innocent about not just baseball, but about our lives. Uh, again, great story. The baseball is fun. And I think the scene with the kids playing baseball on the 4th of July, the fireworks going off, you got America, beautiful, uh, America, the beautiful playing. Love that scene. Just it's something good and pure and patriotic. It's what baseball's supposed to be. Right. Um, I went against nostalgia in the, in the football category. I went against varsity blues. I can't do it again. As much as I love Bull Durham, I'm with you. I love the Sandlot. I'm going with it. And the fans agreed with us by a resounding 38 to 10 vote. Mm-hmm. So the Sandlot is going to the final four. And it is going to face up against the number one overall seed Hoosiers. So I got to ask, what was your wife's argument against you, against she, you when you're in the baseball bracket? And this is a, she, this is a bigger argument that we've had through the whole tournament we've had. Well, first of all, she loves Bull Durham. She loves, she loves the, the, she loves the cast and Bull Durham, the characters she, like us, is not a overwhelming, huge Susan Sarandon fan, but she loved the, the character of Annie Savoy. Um, and and she just loved the the actual movie itself. There, it's one of those movies that, for one reason or another, just touched her. And and she liked the same lot, but her overall argument, and one she's had many times, is like, it's unfair the way we've got some of these movies matched up against other movies. And I told her, you know, some of these movies did get bounced early that, you know, just came up against bad matchups for them. Right. And Which is, is proving like, out in the second chance bracket we're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, she she is – Bull Durham is her baseball movie mm. over and above all others, which surprises me a little. I thought maybe a league of their own or even Major League. No, she's all Bull Durham. She's mm. like – she, she's told me Major League isn't funny. Bull Durham is funny. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, so that's interesting. You said you said Bull Durham is her baseball movie. I would yeah. I would say the Sandlot is mine. Yeah. Well, that is my well, baseball movie. And, and, and oddly enough, I don't know that I have one specific, but I would say I've definitely got very strong feelings about a league of their own, which was was taken out fairly early on by the natural and what the second round. But yeah. You know, that that's one that I really love. Um, and again, maybe it's kind of like the dynamic I have with Remember the Titans, where it's it's the history of it all. Maybe. I don't know. But that that's a movie that just speaks to me. But, yeah, we have got just a tremendous, tremendous final four, Eric. I mean, I don't I don't know. This is going to be, I think, an interesting week next week and definitely. The following week when we come down to that final game and do you have a prediction now that you're thinking for the final game yet? Because I personally am going to have to sit down and watch all four of these again against each other. Are you asking me who I want to see or are you asking me who I think the fans will vote for? I'm asking you just if you think there's a direction that we're going to head. Without giving away your personal views, you know. I think... That given the age bracket of the most people who are on our Facebook page, yeah, I think 
I think Rocky might meet its match in in the final four. Okay. So I think Rocky might make the final final uh, matchup there. Or I'm sorry, I think uh, remember Titans. the Titans will, will take down Rocky in in the fan vote. And I think that the Sandlot giving the resounding vote we just saw might actually in, in the way Hoosier struggled. I think Sandlot has more momentum, which means, again, I think that age group of people, 90s versus 80s, is probably going to be lean more towards the Sandlot. Looks like you and I better brush up our arguments then because it sounds like you and me might uh, be game changers in these. Or not. We, we might. We might. We might not. Um, so so interestingly enough, I if, if I'm not mistaken – Hoosiers was an 80s film or is that a 90s film? Uh, 80s. Uh, 80s, is it? Okay, so you've got – you've got – check this out. This is amazing. You've got Rocky from 76. Hoosiers from the 80s. Sandlot from the 90s. And remember, the Titans was from 2000, wasn't it? Yes, it was. You've got four different uh, – generations four different generations represented here very interesting dude very interesting i think it'll be the younger films i think the younger films are going to get the votes doesn't mean that i'm going to vote that way doesn't mean you're going to vote that way as we know chris i'm now 40 so i'm an old fogey here so uh, this is going to be interesting man the final four now here's the thing I predicted that the final four would be Rocky, Hoosiers, the Sandlot, and Rudy. That was my prediction. I didn't I got three out of the four, which isn't bad. And I also thought Major League would be the, the film that would really um compete against the Sandlot, as how I thought it was. So I got three out of the four, two number one films, a number two film, and a number four film in the rankings. I feel that this is very good final four. How about you, Chris? Oh, I agree 100%. And I'll tell you what, that number four was a number four because of the bracket it was in. Truth. Yes. Because I'll tell you what, if you don't have the natural, if you don't have Moneyball, if you don't have Bull Durham, in that same category with the Sandlot, it's a higher ranked movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Agreed. Absolutely. Also, fans, be make sure you're checking out the second chance bracket. We're putting those films out as we speak. Uh, yesterday, Dodgeball was went up against Semi Pro. These are all movies that lost in the first round that were given a second chance by you folks. <coughs> this morning, <clears throat> Rookie of the Year and the Bad News Bears. Went to uh, head to head. And that was pretty close last I checked. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, the blind side and we are Marshall will go head to head. And then on Tuesday, above the rim and cool runnings. And then on Wednesday, we will start the final four. So Wednesday and Thursday will be when the final four gets its voting. And of course, Sunday, Chris and I will add our third to that. And then uh and then we'll also know probably by Sunday, more than likely, the final four here for the second chance bracket as well. And then next week will be basically the final four votes, man. So it's going to be a lot of a lot of fun with that. The championship uh, championships anyways. And then uh, after that, Chris and I will have a big announcement for everybody cons- that we've kind of been teasing about this uh, sports movie challenge. So. Uh, we we've been kind of working behind the scenes on a few things and we're excited to let everybody know here in a few weeks what that is going to be. And also, Chris, it's almost fantasy football time. man. Are you into fantasy football? Uh, only in about eight leagues. Well, you're going to have to make <laughs> league number nine because we are going to try it again. We did it. We tried it a couple years ago. It, it was OK. But this time we are doing it big time. And here's what I mean by that. We are starting a 12 team keeper league. Oh, so yeah. This is and this is going to be super competitive and money will be involved, folks. So here's the deal. I'm going to put this out on the podcast first, because if you listen to this podcast 
more than likely you're you're not just someone who follows us on Facebook willy nilly. You're the hardcore fan. And so if you are a podcast listener, you enjoy following us, listening to us on the podcast. We want you to be a part of our keeper league. Now, here's the thing. When we draft these guys, OK, we our draft this first year is going to be about the NFL future drafts. You will be drafting a minor league team of college guys that you will then hopefully have develop and enter into your team. And that's what's going to make this league different than anything I know of that's out there, Chris, is that you will have a minor league full of college guys that you will get to replenish your team as they become pros. I think it's a cool idea, Chris. We haven't, I haven't come up with what the dollar amount will be, but we are going to do 12 teams, two divisions. Um, I want to have a lot of fun, and I want to get a community of people together who are super close and super fans of the podcast. You love the podcast. You want to be a part of this. Please send me a message on Facebook or email us at the Ohio podcast at gmail.com. Get a hold of us one way or another. Let us know you want to be a part of this keeper league that we are going to be uh, having. Chris, myself, Aaron, of course. Um, I'll probably have a couple other uh, friends who are obviously listeners of this podcast. We'll see if we can't get 12 people together. I haven't decided if we're going to make it 10 bucks or 20 bucks. We'll see. But here's the thing, man. It's winner. It's winner. Keep all. We're not giving money out for second place. That's not what we do, man. Winner's going to get it all, brother. He's the one. You're, who gets- either your fir- you're the first or the last, Eric. That's it. That's it. <laughs> The only thing you get in last is you'll get the first pick of the draft. How about that? That's what you get for being last. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. You want to be a part of the OHIO Podcast Keeper League. Hit me up. Let me know you want to be a part of it. We'll have, uh, well, like I said, we'll have a nice little entry fee. Winner take all. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Anything else, Chris, before we head out of here? Well, Eric, I just wanted to touch on the fact, you know, we talked uh, last week a little bit about that August 28th date that we'll be at the Ohio State store and more. And I mentioned that we might tease a, tease a few things in there. Well, I just wanted to provide my first teaser um, leading into that, and that is going to be uh, we mentioned that we will have some raffles as well as some giveaways, uh, not just from the store and from you and I, but from some others. Well, we do have a giveaway and uh, or, I'm sorry, a raffle to announce. And the first raffle I'm going to announce is that we are going to uh, raffle off an autographed jersey signed by former Buckeyes running back Maurice Claret. Ooh, that's big time right there, folks. Make sure you come and see us on the 28th at the Ohio State Store in Lots More in Marion, Ohio. You live in the area. I think Jason, one of our friends from Michigan, might be driving all the way down from Michigan to meet us, Chris, and be a part of that. I'll be rooting big time for him to be a part of that raffle. Um, So I'm looking forward. if, if, if uh, If he actually drives all the way down from Michigan to show up and hang out with us, I think we definitely need to invite him on at least for a couple minutes to chat. What do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm working on some big stuff uh, behind the scenes. We also might be taking this baby on the road all the way, possibly to Pittsburgh. So we're uh, hoping, right? Yeah. So working on that. Um, we're going to be having a lot of cool stuff this season. Can't wait for Aaron to get back. He should be returning within the next month and a half here. So looking forward to having him back as well. And uh, we're going to get into it next week. We started a little bit with the uh, non-conference teams this week. Next week, we start diving into the Big Ten. Recruiting still hot right now for Ohio State. We're going to be covering that as well. Uh, We'll be getting into position groups as we get closer to the season, Chris, breaking down this Ohio State roster even more. And, of course, we'll be finishing up with this uh, amazing 2064 Sports Movie Challenge here in the next weeks, next couple weeks, and then having a big announcement on that end as well. I'm winded, brother. I'm ready to get out of here. How about you? Oh, man, me too. I'm ready. It looks like the rain has finally stopped up here in now beautiful Akron, Ohio, and uh, ready to get back on the road and head back down towards central Ohio. You know, got the big uh, week coming up, and uh, yeah. So, as we come to another, uh, the conclusion of another 
edition of the OHIO podcast. As always, be kind to one another. I owe someone's OH. And St. Carmen, Ohio, with all your heart. And until next time, OH! I owe! Go Bucks! Oh, come, let's sing, oh, highest praise and songs through armor rain while our hearts rebounding thrill and joy which death alone can still summer's heat or winter's cold the seasons pass the years will roll time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship oh hi yo